Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, Chapter 26, Reproductive System, Part 3, Ovarian Uterine Cycle. Well, before we go into the ovarian uterine cycle, let's uh, remember the mammillary glands. So, when you look at the breast, it has a few uh, structures. Externally, you can see the nipple, which is the pigmented projection, uh, which within it has closely spaced openings of the lactiferous ducts. And this is where milk emerges. Around that is the areola, which is a uh, circular pigmented area of the skin. Looking inside the breast, you see that it has many uh, suspensory ligaments, which uh, connect and support the breast itself. And also, it has uh, the mammillary glands, which are many uh, lobes. And within each lobes are these little lobules. And within the lobules is the alveoli, uh, familiar name, right, uh, in which milk secreting glands are found within the lobules. And they, of course, secrete milk. And when it's secreted, it goes through the uh, lactiferous uh, sinus where it is stored. But only some milk is stored. There usually is being produced when the baby actually needs it. However, um, when that finally occurs and... Um, baby needs the milk, uh, the milk will be ejected through the uh, lactiferous ducts, again found in the nipple. Some disorders associated with breasts include breast cancer, which is the second leading cause of death from cancer in women. Uh, this usually occurs after the age of 30, and in order to um, check for this, uh, women at a certain age are asked to go through annual mam mammograms using a mam mammography, which is basically a type of radiography using very sensitive x-ray film. And in the process, it's required that the woman's um, breasts are flattened out as much as possible. And then they will be able to detect a denser area where the cancer would be. Now, should a woman be found to have cancer, one of the more extreme treatments is a radical mastectomy, which is the removal of the affected breast, along with underlying pectoral muscles and the axillary lymph nodes. So that's an actual extreme sort of treatment, but some women feel it's necessary. All right, the ovarian uterine cycle. Well, this is the control of the uh, ovaries and the uterus in a coordinated way through hormones. And if we're talking about hormones and they're being controlled, we're obviously going to start with our dear friend, the hypothalamus. And its control over the anterior pituitary gland's ability to release follicular stimulating hormones and luteinizing hormones. So, basically the way it goes is the early stages of the ovarian cycle when the um, primordial follicles are being stimulated to form primary follicles. This is controlled by uh, the follicle stimulating hormone. It's stimulating the formation of a more mature follicle. Makes sense. And um, this also leads to the secretion of estrogen in the ovary. And then when you get near the end of the follicle's development, you have the of the luteinizing hormone in the anterior pituitary. This triggers the actual ovulation event and also promotes the formation of the corpus luteum, which will then produce uh, estrogens, progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin. And this, of course, has to be coordinated with the uh, development of the proper uh, stratum functionalis nice and rich in blood vessels and a place for a fertilized ovum to uh, embed. So it is by the production of estrogen by the uh, ovaries that stimulates and initiates um, the development of the stratum functionalis and then the use of progesterone and estrogens to maintain the stratum functionalis. And when these enzyme, uh, hormones are no longer being produced, you have what is referred to as menstruation, or the sloughing off of the stratum functionalis. So again, um, early stages here, you see the stratum functionalis being built. End stages, 
uh, you have a much bigger stratum functionalis ready for a uh, zygote to be embedded. So people have uh, broken this up into four stages. So there are four stages to the ovarian uterine cycle. The very first stage here is menstruation. So the beginning of all is menstruation, the sloughing off of the old stratum functionalis. Um, in ovaries, this is when the follicle stimulating hormone is stimulating follicular development. And since you now have a decline in estrogen uh, progesterone presence, that's when also the stratum functionality sloughs off. Then, uh, after a couple days into the cycle, you get to the pre-ovulatory phase. During the pre-ovulatory phase, uh, the follicle is de continuing to development, leading to the uh, production of estrogen by the ovary. Um, and then this estrogen stimulates the regrowth of the stratum functionalis within the uterine. Then you have the post, uh, uh, the ovulation event uh, triggered by higher concentrations of uh, lutein, luteinizing hormone. Uh, this will trigger uh, the formation of the corpus luteum from the remains of the mature follicle found in the ovary. Uh, the lutum, lutum, um, corpus luteum will then produce progesterone and other estrogens, and it is the progesterone that is going to uh, basically maintain the presence of the uh, fully formed uh, stratum functionalis. The corpus luteum usually lasts for about two weeks, So what we see here is if you have no estrogen or progesterone, the hypothalamus is going to produce a low amount of the gonadotrophin-releasing hormones, uh, which will then uh, stimulate the production of the follicle-stimulating hormone, which will then start both the formation of the follicles, and also since there is no uh, estrogen or progesterone, you'll also have the menstruation event occurring. Uh, then when estrogen levels build up because the follicle stimulating hormone is leading to follicles that lead to the production of estrogen, um, this will lead to a high production of the gonadotrophin releasing hormones by the hypothalamus, which will then stimulate the production of the luteinizing hormones in the anterior pituitary. This leads to ovulation, which leads to the formation of the corpus luteum, which then is producing estrogen and progesterone. The progesterone will then act as an inhibitor suppressing the production of any more gonadotropin-releasing hormones because we don't need to stimulate a new round of follicle development because we're waiting to see if uh, pregnancy is going to occur. If fertilization and implantation occurs, then the little embryo is going to start producing uh, human chorionic gonadotropin. Actually, technically, it's the placenta that's producing this hormone. And this will then extend the life of the corpus luteum, which means you'll continue to have production of estro uh, progesterone, which means that um, basically they're saying, hey, we do not need to start making another follicle. We think an actual fetus is going to develop. And that's how that cycle is all interrelated. All right, disorders. Well, you could have premenstrual syndrome. This is, would be a cyclical disorder, uh, usually associated with severe physical and emotional distress. It starts at the post-ovulatory phase, so after uh, ovulation has occurred, and ends when actual menstruation begins. And while its exact cause is unknown, um, it can be pretty severe in some uh, women. Then there's the premenstrual distress disorder. This disorder has more severe sim sim symptoms than in PMS and it does not resolve. So basically uh, this woman, as long as there are ovarian hormones being produced, is having the experience of what PMS is, but it's like all the time, which would be pretty tough on a person. All right, I want to give a shout out to pregnancy. We don't talk about it in this uh, chapter, but it is what occurs next. The implantation of the ovum, which develops into an embryo, which then becomes a fetus, and you also, of course, have the placenta developed, and interconnection of the blood streams of both the mom and the uh, fetus. 
uh, before conception, the uterus is usually the size of about a fist, but during the growth of the fetus, you see the uterus getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it actually reaches where the xiphoid process of the sternum is. Quite a large expansion, and it's all resting on the urinary bladder. And of course, childbirth, you have, when they talk about dilation, they're talking about dilation of the cervix, showing that it's expanding in order to allow the baby to be expelled, uh, contraction of the uterus, leading to expulsion of the baby, and then finally, uh, the placental expulsion afterwards, often called the afterbirth. Uh, uh, other disorders of reproductive system include STDs. They can be bacterial infections such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Uh, the, those bacterial infections can be treated nowadays by um, antibiotics, which is good since gonorrhea can lead to um, blindness in infants if they happen to be um, born in a mother who has gonorrhea. And syphilis can lead to insanity and death. And then there's also some viral infections, such as genital herpes that produce painful blisters and genital warts, uh, which is thought to be tied also to uh, many cases of cervical cancer in women and the rare cases of penile cancer in men. And fortunately, there is now a vaccine for genital warts, which will hopefully uh, lead to the, a reduction in the cases of cervical cancer in women. Birth control, well, there's abstinence. There's sterile, surgical sterilization through a vasectomy or a tubal ligation. There are hormones that women can take to basically trick their body into thinking that they are pregnant. And then there's poisons such as spermaticides. And then there's blocking methods such as an intrauterine device, which will block the sperm's entry into the uterus. And the barrier method, such as the male condom, the vaginal pouch or female condom, a diaphragm or a cervical cap. And then of course there is the periodic abstinence, which basically means that they only have sex in the stages of the uterine ovarian cycle in which it's least likely that the woman will become pregnant. Abortion. Abortion is sort of the most extreme way of um, dealing with uh, pregnancy. Uh, you can have, it's basically just the premature, premature expulsion of the products of conception from the uterus this can be spontaneous, then it's often called a miscarriage, or it can be induced. It can be induced early on, up to nine weeks, by the abortion pill. Uh, past that, you can use vacuum aspiration. Yes, they use a flexible tube to vacuum out the embryo placenta and uterine lining. Uh, you can have dilation and evac evacuation if um, they need some, uh, a slightly larger fetus to be removed. Uh, there's also late stage abortion from 16 to 24 weeks which use is a similar method of the evac aspiration, or it can uh, be involved injecting same solution into the uh, fetus, killing it, and then inducing labor. And then there's the intact dilation and evacuation, often known as partial growth abortion, where the uh, fetus is partially uh, born, and then the brain is removed, thereby killing it before it's actually officially completely born. Because uh, current laws and all is the uh, fetus is not considered a person until it's actually outside of the woman's body. Uh, development of external genitalia, developmentally with the embryos, this occurs around five weeks, sort of leading either on a pathway toward the male or the female development. This is solely dependent on testosterone production and therefore the Y chromosome. Um, and basically, you can see that parts of the female and male genitalia are actually developmentally the same. Uh, there's also a disorder called intersex or ambiguous genitalia, where uh, infants are born with genitalia that's kind of part way, one way or the other. And this is thought to be occurring more often in baby boys, uh, possibly because of the uh, endocrine disruptors that are becoming more common in plastics and more common in our environment. Uh, that's it for this uh, lecture. I hope you enjoyed it.